Good evening. Welcome to the program. I'm Leland Bitter. President Biden and President Putin were eye to eye today. And tonight, you get to decide who left with the upper hand and whether President Putin believes America will respond to a Russian invasion of Ukraine. This is how the Kremlin wants you to see things. A cheery President Biden waving as Mr. Putin sits stone-faced, almost smirking. And the only video we have of the interaction is from the Kremlin. And it shows basically the same dynamic. Of course, that's what the Kremlin wants you to see. And this is how they want you to see the meeting portrayed. Good to see you again. I, uh, unfortunately, last time I we didn't get to see one another at the G20. I hope next time we meet, we do it in person. Now we will show you what the White House put out. These three pictures from the White House Situation Room shows a different moment on the call and noteworthy, not a single soundbite. Overseas and at the White House, I covered countless summits and meetings of foreign leaders with the president. What's said is often far less important than the body language and demeanor of the two leaders as they interact. All of it is captured by an independent press pool. That is when people meet in person. For a virtual summit, as we saw and evidenced by the pictures and video, that's not the case. So the pictures and video put out by the White House and Kremlin telegraph a lot about their view of the meeting. The Kremlin's view is on the left. The White House's view is on the right. The call lasted two hours or so and centered around Russian aggression in Ukraine. The Russians have about 100,000 troops on the border of Ukraine and aircraft as well ready to support a land invasion. Experts expect a possible invasion as soon as January, when the ground in Ukraine would be frozen enough to allow Putin's tanks to roll unimpeded into that former Soviet satellite. Putin's forces took part of southern Ukraine back in 2014. Back then, President ba Obama talked tough, but did very little to stop Putin's army. Ukraine's mineral and coal-rich east would provide valuable hard assets to Putin's struggling economy. Its additional ports in the Black Sea allow Russia to project force into the Mediterranean. Plus, taking especially the red part there of Ukraine, you see, and all the way over most to the E in Ukraine, fits very nicely into Putin's desire to bring back Soviet glory and plays into his rhetoric of a larger mother Russia. Today, the National Security Advisor said the response from now President Biden would be very different from then 2014 when Vice President Biden was in office. Take a listen. I will look you in the eye and tell you, as President Biden looked President Putin in the eye and told him today, that things we did not do in 2014, we are prepared to do now. President Putin has already humiliated three American presidents. Did it to President Bush with the invasion of Georgia, did it to President Obama with Ukraine, and of course, did it to President Trump. The general consensus is that Mr. Biden is perhaps playing a little more coy than his predecessors, who were charmed and then manipulated by the former KGB operative. Remember, Putin started meeting American presidents early in life. There he is with the camera around his neck. He was a KGB major at the time, running spies when he first met President Reagan in Red Square back in the 80s. It's pretty clear committing American troops to protect Ukraine is off the table. But there is something, perhaps, that Putin cares more about than Ukraine, money, and his friends, money. Which brings us to the Nord Stream 2 pipeline that allows Russian natural gas to flow into Europe for sale. Runs from just north of St. Petersburg down into the western part of Europe. It provides the Kremlin cronies with billions in hard currency. And Mr. Biden approved the pipeline just a few months ago, giving Putin a big win. Today, Jake Sullivan threatened to take that win away. If Vladimir Putin wants to see gas flow through that pipeline, he may not want to take the risk of invading Ukraine. Why should you care? Well, to start, treaty obligations require the United States to protect Ukraine's sovereignty. We made that promise when they gave up their nukes. Plus, a Russian invasion of Ukraine makes a move against NATO all the more likely in which U.S. troops would be forced to directly fight the Russians. Now for the political side of this. During the 2020 election, then-candidate Biden called Mr. Trump Putin's puppet. 
I don't understand why this president is unwilling to take on Putin when he's actually paying bounties to kill American soldiers in Afghanistan, when he's engaged in activities that are trying to destabilize all of NATO. I don't know why he doesn't do it, but it's worth asking the question, why isn't that being done? So now it is Mr. Biden's turn to stand up to Vladimir Putin or not. But standing up to Putin is just the beginning. However, that's where we start with News Nation's Kelly Meyer, North Lawn of the White House this evening. Kelly, good evening. Good evening, Leland. Well, the White House framing this discussion as direct and candid. They said Putin was, quote, deeply engaged. A State Department official telling Congress today that she's confident the president's message got through. I think Putin understood. You know, I, I try very hard not to get inside the mind of President Putin. I'll leave that for others. The White House is hoping the president's message to Putin got through, de-escalating the situation between Russia and Ukraine. They're threatening sanctions and to fortify allies in the region. Here's the White House trying to intensify the threats against Russia today. The president was clear with President Putin that, that if they invade Ukraine, we have a range of economic options uh, to take, and they will be significant and they will be severe. But I'm not going to parse what every... And the Kremlin today uh, emphasizing that Biden said that they were alleged threats nature from Russia movements. But Putin says the responsibility should not be shifted onto the shoulders of Russia, saying NATO is making attempts to conquer Ukraine. Leland, what happens now, uh, how Russia will react, remains unknown. The White House saying, quote, today, let's see. Yeah, well, we will, we will see, especially now that military options are um, off the table. Kelly, thank you so much. We appreciate it. No one watched the Biden-Putin summit more closely than the Chinese. You can bet Xi Jinping and his military advisors followed every smile, every frown, and every sudden movement with laser-like vision. We know China has ambitions of passing the U.S. as the world's perennial superpower, perhaps in the meantime, replacing the Soviet Union as the other superpower in America. This is Dean Chang, one expert describing the CCP's rapid military advancements. Years from now, we will see a China whose military strategy is being fulfilled by a military that has modernized according to long laid out plans. China has already deployed technology that the U.S. doesn't have. The Wall Street Journal reporting the U.S. needs a hypersonic capability now, comparing it to the attack on Pearl Harbor 80 years ago today. The article says Americans must now wonder whether China is setting the stage for another devastating attack on American forces using another U.S. pioneered technology, hypersonic missiles. If that doesn't bother you, then this should. These are satellite images from a desert in China. What you're looking at right there are mock-ups of U.S. carriers that the Chinese are using for target practice. That carrier has, if it was a real U.S. carrier, 4,000 or so American sailors and Marines. So think about what the Chinese are practicing blowing up. So far, all we've done in response to that Chinese provocation is a diplomatic boycott of the Beijing Olympics. My guest last night said he thinks the move means effectively nothing. This is the minimum that this administration could have done. Uh, it's not going to affect the Chinese and their behavior. The Chinese have certainly learned it does what it wants, when they want, so far unchecked. Times like this, we bring in a man with extensive knowledge of the Chinese Communist Party, author of the great U.S.-China tech war, the coming collapse of China, Gordon Chang, uh, with us now. Gordon, always good to see you. We appreciate it. Uh, that Wall Street Journal op-ed was just damning, that the Chinese now have stolen so much of the U.S. hypersonic missile technology that they're handcuffing American forces with, with what we pioneered. Yes, and a couple things here. First of all, you go back to the 1960s, Leland, we were the leader in hypersonic flight. The X-15 flew 6.7 Mach, but we decided not to develop this technology because we didn't want to start an arms race. But we didn't understand the psychology of the Chinese and Russians who did not reciprocate the um, reticence and the restraint. The other thing about this, what we have not heard from the White House, what we have not heard from the Pentagon, is that China's test of this hypersonic glide vehicle is essentially an in, uh, announcement of an intention to violate the Outer Space Treaty. And, and we've heard crickets 
this is uh, this is really a dereliction of duty. Yeah, no question that the hypersonic glide vehicle is a first strike weapon. There's no other reason that you come up with this that could be armed with a nuclear warhead. Big picture. Uh, the Chinese love playing the victim. The Russians almost love playing the victim more, which is what we heard from Kelly Meyer, the way the Russians uh, are spinning this. How did Beijing take the combination of yesterday's diplomatic boycott and combined with today's somewhat tough words towards Moscow? On the diplomatic boycott, it is a step in the right direction, and the Chinese were enraged. But it's clearly not enough because China is committing genocide and other crimes against humanity. And clearly, we have an obligation to do more. I'm sure, as you point out, that the Chinese were watching very carefully the response of the Biden administration to Ukraine. And as they saw in the fall of Afghanistan, as they saw in the disarray after the uh, President Biden's comments on October 21 at the CNN town hall on Taiwan, they see an administration that is not capable of opposing them. And so we could very well um, witness something which is horrible. And that is, once the Russians move on Ukraine, China will move on somebody on its periphery, mm -hmm. and we will see conflicts at both ends of the Eurasian landmass. Well, on that note, what else could possibly go wrong? Um, the Chinese also put out this video of essentially a missile hidden inside a cargo ship. Um, it came from the sun, but this is a mock-up of a Chinese missile system, which would allow them to put that container on any ship that says it's carrying sofas, and it turns out it would be carrying uh, sea-based cruise missiles. This coincides with China rebuilding their Blue Water Navy and then putting investments uh, around the world. We heard yesterday they were trying to put a port, uh, a military port on the east coast uh, of, the of the Atlantic, on uh, Africa's uh, west coast, so on the eastern half of the Atlantic. And then also, uh, we did a little research, they've already poured hundreds of billions of dollars into the Caribbean, which conceivably that money is not spent in charity. Yes. Well, you know, they own Jamaica right now, and they have put more money into the Caribbean than we have recently. And that's also true of Central and South America. Um, this is a continent um, that very much is in China's pocket right now, and, and we have neglected this. So this is our fault. This is the failure of a series of American presidents to recognize the threat in China. And it's not just that China wants to surpass us. Every country, of course, wants to be number one. I don't have a problem with that. But what China is doing is it's trying to take down the Westphalian international system that's been in place since 1648. And this is a revolutionary regime that demands to rule the world. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, there was another uh, Asian regime, and that was the Imperial Empire of Japan that wanted to rule the world. Eighty years ago today, they hit Pearl Harbor. Uh, are there any lessons, perhaps, that the Chinese have learned in those 80 years that if they decide to move on Taiwan uh, that they would take into account? The lessons the Chinese have learned is that when you hit the United States, you've got to kill on the first shot. And the Chinese obviously intend to do that. Not only do they have the hypersonic glide vehicles, they've got disease, and there will be sabotage on their from their agents in the United States taking down our infrastructure. They are a much weaker society than we are, Leland, but we're not defending ourselves. They call no. us an enemy, and we just say they're a competitor. So we could lose our country. Well, they certainly do and treat us uh, like an enemy on so many uh, levels. It's interesting that you talk about sort of where they're willing to compete. One of the places uh, is space. Seth Bolton, a uh, Democrat and veteran, uh, congressman from Massachusetts, agrees with you. Take a listen. Space is one of those places where China is trying to get way ahead of us. Uh, we need to change to keep up. What's always stunning to me is that you hear from Democrats and Republicans on both sides of the aisle, China is a rising threat, China is an enemy, they beat the war drums, and then somehow, some way, the bills to hold China accountable for genocide against the Uyghurs and ban bills go by the wayside in Congress. Every administration says they're gonna stand up to the Chinese, somehow it never happens. What control over Washington does China have? Uh, for one thing, it's money, of course. One thing is the hope that China can be integrated into the international system. The American people should be outraged at their presidents because those presidents that are supposed to protect us haven't. Um, and by the way, Leland, 
the Chinese talk about the moon and Mars as sovereign Chinese territory. So this is a ruling group that believes it not only must rule the world, it must rule the near parts of the solar system. Yeah, well, I believe they have a rover on uh, the moon, at least uh, right now, as, as we see some of the pictures. You point out it's been both Republicans and Democrats who've been derelict in dealing uh, with China from the White House. Uh, Gordon, it's always good to see you, even if the uh, news, shall we say, is bleak, sir. Thank you so much, Leland. Yeah, thanks for the time and the honest assessment. Coming up, is the definition of fully vaccinated about to change? Just how many boosters you're going to need? And closing arguments in the Jesse Smollett trial are about to begin. What taking the stand meant for his case? Local judge weighs in. We've seen so many of these videos, and they are continuing through the holidays. Smash and grab robberies in major retail establishments around America. Crime is up in major cities, a big coast to coast. Police say they know what they need to do to fight back, but effectively their hands have been tied. Lieutenant Tracy McRae of the San Francisco Police Department says her city is spiraling out of control and blames lax policies. With us tonight, Lieutenant, uh, it's good to see you. You see these sort of smash and grabs and these looting gangs that are going around and in cleaning out these stores. Uh, is this something new and that there's a lot more of it, or is it that we're just now seeing it on videotape because everybody has a phone? Well, I think it's the latter. You're seeing it more on, on videotape because everyone has a phone now. But this has been happening for a while now, uh, and you're now starting to get the upfront view of it because everybody's out and they have their phones out and they're just waiting for it to happen and they're capturing it and you're just seeing it. Okay, so if it's been happening for a while, are we to believe that, the, that somehow policies have been lax for a while, which is allowing this? Well, I think the policies, the laws have changed, like the a ACLU, we have to ask ourselves, are they more into protecting people who are committing these crimes instead of the public safety for everyone? So them backing a Prop 47, which is reducing the penalties, them backing a uh, reduction in sentences uh, for repeat offenders, you know, is it just a free-for-all for everyone because they just want to let everyone out of jail, but there's no game plan for what you do with these people once they are released. So how do you stop them from going back to their old lives? Yeah, you brought up Prop 47, which was a proposition put to the voters uh, in California a couple of years ago. Uh, it changed felonies for theft to misdemeanors for items under $950, so at some point it wasn't worth prosecuting. Uh, this reform, the ACL wrote, will focus our law enforcement resources on violent and serious crime and use the savings in prison spending to prevent crime. So they said that a few years ago. I'll let you fact check it. Well, what have they spent it on? Because crime is going back up, violent crime, these property crimes. So where is this savings? So under the guise of this Safe Neighborhood, Safe School Act, uh, yeah, we'll reduce the amount you can steal, and it's not a felony anymore. But, you know, even if you do get caught, we're not going to do anything. For instance, the woman who just got arrested, Ariza Graves, for committing 120 acts of theft, they let her out, and guess what? She stole again. He got arrested. So <laughs> I, I, what, 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 how are they helping? Yeah, for, they're, for they're some reason, I don't think that, that came as a huge surprise to you, that 121st. Uh, no. No, no, not that at all. she didn't show up to court? No. Yeah. That she didn't get fit with an ankle monitor? No, none of that came as a surprise. So we've created this website with our partners, uh, our un other union partners called ACLU-watch.com. People could click on that, go and see how the ACLU has really taken away from public safety. They've, they've, they've destroyed it. There is no public safety. That's, a, that's terrifying. Um, in simplistic, it's a simplistic way to put it, but terrifying at the same time to say there's no public safety. This comes, though, as there's been this war against the police that we've reported on, we've talked to you about. Uh, in San Francisco, a San Francisco restaurant refused to serve on-duty police officers. The backlash uh, was swift. Well, it ought to be. But more importantly, uh, is it that people feel as though they don't need the police? I would assume that these restaurants and everybody else don't, mi don't mind calling you all when something bad happens. Right, we're like the Ghostbusters. Who are you going to call? You're going to yeah. call the police when something happens. Hey, you know what? If you don't want to serve us, fine. 
I'll go pay $50 for eggs and avocado toast at more than enough restaurants who do appreciate us coming in there and whether we're on duty or off duty, patronizing their restaurants, contributing to the community, right? So you know what? You don't want to serve us? Whatever. There's a door. See you later. Yeah, well, um, they may not want to serve you, but we sure appreciate you all standing guard. And I know it's, I know it's tough, and it's become even tougher uh, these days. It was good talking to you as always, ma'am. Thank you. You too. Thank you, Leland. What are your thoughts, Jesse? Jesse Smollett seemed to be in good spirits as he left court this afternoon. He spent the morning on the witness stand in his own defense. Special Prosecutor Dan Webb picking up his cross-examination. Smollett continued to deny any involvement in the attack. Closing arguments begin tomorrow in the trial of Jesse Smollett. The defense rested its case today. The actor is accused of staging a racist and homophobic hate crime against himself in Chicago two years ago. We also learned today that Smollett kept in contact in the hours leading up to the attack with one of the two Nigerian brothers accused of helping him stage the hoax attack. Smollett reportedly got angry at the prosecutor today as he pressed him about Instagram messages where they were in touch together. The former Empire star continues to insist he was the real victim. Joining us now, man who knows a thing or two about victims and criminals as well, Judge David Erickson, former justice of the Illinois Appellate Court. Uh, first things first, boy, wouldn't it be great if we had TV cameras in that courtroom? Well, it would make it easier for you, and it would make it easier for me. But I think Judge Lynn waited. And there was a reason I think he waited this way. It's discretionary, and it's a case in which the defendant is an actor. And it's a case where part of the defense has been a little bit of chaos going. And if you put cameras in the courtroom and you have an actor and you have a little bit of chaos going and you throw stuff up on the wall, you got a way. What's the fair trial here and what's the chaos that can be caused and let the trial get out of hand? And I think he made the right choice. It could have gone the other way and it would be much easier to do all, everything you're doing right now. Yeah, it, would have been, it would have been fascinating just to watch. And, and transparency is important in a case like this because this really became a national case in the beginning when everyone thought it was real and it was Trump supporters who attacked this uh, gay actor uh, and put a noose around his neck, which if true would have been horrible. And then we learned that it didn't happen. You listen to his, Jesse, De Jesse Smoltz's defense. He took the stand, which is unusual. Uh, it was essentially, you know, I can't be guilty because I was sexually involved with one of the people who is accused of planning the attack or who admits to planning the attack. I visited bathhouses with him, and therefore we were talking about other things. I'm not guilty. Is that a fair assessment? It's fair, along with five hours of I didn't do it, and I didn't do it, and I didn't do it, and then kind of a development of his personality. And it's hard to tell what his personality showed, to, showed the jury. Some of the things he said sound arrogant, Maybe they're not in real life. When you say, I'm the black Cary Grant from the witness stand, that's putting yourself right out there as an actor, I have to say. Um, when you say, I've never done it at Ancestry.com in response to why didn't you do a DNA test? There's a lot of sarcasm in, in those statements, but it depends on how it sounds in the courtroom. You think about sort of somebody who's an actor who, who is trained in this. You watched him in the Robin Roberts, Good Morning America, uh, interview. Is that different than being cross-examined by a career prosecutor like Mr. Webb? Oh, absolutely. Uh, Webb and Roberts did it, was nice to him. Dan Webb is one of the finest lawyers in this country and has been, the United States Attorney here. Every person who we've had on to talk about the Smollett case says the same thing about him. Well, he, he, it, because it's true. Um, he was the United States Attorney. He, he convicted a governor. And it, the irony of his, at one point in his life, his big, the, the case you'd remember him for is convicting a governor. And now people are always going to remember this case, win or lose. It's kind of a, a strange thing because it's disorderly conduct. It's disorderly conduct, but it has become a metaphor and a proxy for so much else in America. Uh, if Jesse Smollett is convicted, uh, what's going to happen to him? Um, could he go to jail? I guess a lot of that's going to depend upon what kind of remorse he would show, if any. And we don't seem to see much of that now. But if he, in elocution, he said something that was remorseful, um, he's got no criminal background at all. So he, he could avoid jail. Um, probation, though, given to him, 
I would have to say that Judge Lynn is a very creative judge. He's been around a long time. I think if he gets probation from Judge Lynn, he's going to have a series of conditions he's going to have to meet. And he's going to have to do a lot of community service, and it's not going to just be stuff in envelopes somewhere. Uh, real quick, your closing arguments tomorrow, your prediction on how long the jury stays out. I, I think um, it shouldn't be a long verdict because you either believe him or you don't believe him. Yeah, it becomes very simple. It's do you very simple. Do you, do you believe when he was on the stand or not? Hey, Judge, this was a great conversation. Thank, thank you. you. No, it was good you. to see him. Thanks. Democrats want President Biden to be doing more on immigration as another migrant caravan is heading towards the border. Plus, police speaking out, as we just heard. They say their hands are tied and, well, we're all paying higher prices at the cash register because of it. And then we started to fight back, and, and vaccines came, and we focused on vaccination. It made all the difference. We're now the safest place in this country, but we've got to go even farther. Hmm. Lame duck, very lame duck mayor of New York City, Bill de Blasio, stepping up his push to get people vaccinated after mandating that all private businesses in the city require employees to get the shot, but kind of begs the question, now that there's so much talk about booster shots, what exactly is fully vaccinated? Is it two shots? Is it two shots plus a booster? Does one shot of the J&J &J still count? Well, Israel is now weighing a fourth booster shot for immunocompromised people. You might remember that's how booster shots began, was they were only for immunocompromised people. Now, everybody's supposed to get one. So far, the CDC only requires you to have your initial COVID doses. But again, will a booster shot become the new standard amid the Omicron variant? and winter coming, more people are gathering inside. Right now, 60% of Americans are fully vaccinated under the two-dose standard, and more than 71% are partially vaccinated. And we always like to point out just how effective the vaccine actually is. We're gonna put up the last graphic here. Take the population of San Jose, California, population of just about 1 million people. According to the CDC, Using the last real data we had from flu, 152 people will die from flu or pneumonia every year. Then we used the death rates back in August when the Delta variant was at its peak and people were also vaccinated from COVID. Of those million people in San Jose, if they were all unvaccinated, 138 of them would die of COVID. And if they were all vaccinated, less than 20 of that million would die. So it does work. Dr. Rajiv Fernando, global infectious disease specialist, fellow in disaster medicine at Harvard Medical School, joins us now. Doc, uh, as I said before, uh, if we'd written your specialties down ourselves, we couldn't come up with anybody better to talk to. Uh, are we right to wonder whether pretty soon being vaccinated is going to mean being boosted as well? That's a great question. At the moment, uh, the two-dose regimen is sufficient to say uh, one is fully vaccinated. Now, that begs uh, the thought, um, what is the future like? Uh, so for the two reasons I'm going to mention right now, fully uh, a booster does not constitute fully vaccinated. Firstly, with the new Omicron strain, uh, I am fairly certain, I'm very certain as a matter of fact, there will be uh, some evasion from the immune system of the vaccine. So is there is our companies like Pfizer and Moderna, they're gonna be, they are definitely gonna be making changes to their vaccine. How quick can this be? About three months. Uh, the second reason is with regards to the global scene, the WHO. So the WHO is still around the world. People still haven't gotten even a single dose. So, you know, about 7% of the impoverished countries have gotten you know, a single dose. So this is uh, a huge problem over here. So I don't see this term uh, getting two doses and a booster constitutes fully vaccinated anytime soon. Interesting. In, in Israel, they're already there. You have to have three doses to have their, their green passport. Uh, this is kind of fun, yeah. though. Um, in, you have to take the Atlantic with a grain of salt because there's a unique amount of intellectual elitism that they uh, project. But their original headline uh, today. Is it safe to hang out with the unboosted? Uh, which after some, uh, shall we say, Twitter mentions, changed to how to socially socialize safely in the booster uh, era. But 
there's this group that seems to think you just you can't be too careful. There's just not enough vaccine. No, that there is a plethora of vaccines in the United States. There's never going to be. A no, deficiency. I was saying there's a, there's a group of people who just and millions want everybody store. to have more vaccines. But the question is, with regards to hanging out, that you mentioned with an unboosted person, well, even hanging out with a vaccinated person without a mask still poses a risk. I mean, because they're what we call breakthrough infections, yeah. and I think that's where we're going to start seeing a lot of breakthrough infections with the Omicron strain because the vaccine is not current vaccine is not good enough. Now, to put that in perspective, the current vaccine may not be good enough to prevent mild disease, but take this to the bank. It will definitely prevent you from severe disease, hospitalizations, and death. So there definitely is bang for your buck with the current dose, current vaccines that we have in the market today. Boy, I'm so happy you said that and acknowledged that, that yeah, you, you may not go to the hospital and you're not going to die, but maybe you get, you get the cold. You know, everybody goes about their life during cold season without masks on, during flu season without masks on. We go to Christmas parties. We have great times. If the worst that you're going to get from Omicron is a cold because you're vaccinated and vaccines work, what are we possibly worried about here? No, the thing, well, let's start this. Up. So by, by now, many people in the world know about the mildest illness that's, uh, you know, the Omicron strain is causing. That's what's data that's coming out of South Africa. But it's also important to know that South Africa, about 33% of South Africans are young. In the U.S., only 21% are considered young population. So that could be skewing the data. We really need to study more. But, you know, getting vaccinated, nobody wants to get this uh, syndrome at all. The other problem is take this to the bank as well, Lester, that this is going to be way more infectious. So it's going to spread rapidly. Mm. And we don't have enough data on what type of disease it causes in the immune compromised patients, like you pointed out. Israel is always ahead of the curve. They are the goal for me. Uh, they're the gold standard with Pfizer. That it was done there first. Yeah, Israel it was done is very always well. the gold standard. Yeah, I don't think we need to go that distance to talk about a fourth dose right now. That theory exists, uh, but <laughs> certainly I don't think it yeah. should be part of any guidelines to get a fourth dose. I, let's talk about that later on. But yeah, for I'm, now, I'm, I, 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 I think I, the best thing... I, I hear you. I'm old enough to remember when, when Israel talked about a third dose, everybody that we interviewed as well goes, oh, no, hold off. That's not going to happen. No one's going to talk about a third dose. And then a couple of months later, here we are. Hey, Doc, we got to run, but this was a great conversation. We're going to have you back, all right? Thanks so yeah, much for being here. Stay excellent safe, America. Get boosted. Yeah, great, great advice, as you, just, as you just said. All right, well, take a look at this video coming from the Texas Department of Public Safety as they fly up the Rio Grande. Those are all patrol boats, a flotilla of Texas Department of Public Safety boats on the Rio Grande taking new steps to try and keep migrants out of the Lone Star State. The governor sent boats to the Rio Grande, part of a blockade, and those boats are every couple of hundred yards based on my last visit to the Rio Grande. There's another migrant caravan heading towards the United States, 8,000 people strong. New numbers from Customs and Border Protection show people just do not seem to be deterred by the newly implemented Remain in Mexico policy, although it's not really been implemented in some of the more, shall we say, migrant crossing heavy areas. Crossings right now, since October 1st, 101,808. That's a 163% increase from 2020. And that's the people we know about. 9,500 plus people are known gotaways. That means that the Border Patrol saw them and they quite literally got away. To give you a better perspective, agents caught 2,284 people in one day this past weekend in the Rio Grande Valley. That's 95 people per hour. And as we pointed out, those are just the ones the agents are actually finding. Independent journalist Alec Bradley traveled hundreds of miles with a, one of the migrant caravans that is now near the southern border, joins us tonight from Yuma, Arizona. Uh, all right, Alec, is anyone talking about this change in policy of Remain in Mexico? You know, Leland, they are. Yesterday we heard from some migrants who have crossed over illegally who were waiting for processing from Border Protection. And they had said that they were coming right now because they knew that that law, MPP, we know about the Remain in Mexico policy was being reinstated. Well, they know as well. So they were flooding the border. We saw at least 4,000 people here in Yuma, Arizona yesterday. Those people have all but pretty much cleared out. Now we're looking at hundreds. So you can see behind me, we see people walking right now. They're walking to another area along the border wall where border protection is. 
So, so they no, are, Ali, I hate to interrupt you. I just want to understand. So the people, the people like behind you. Yeah, the people behind Allie, and we're going to have to unfortunately say goodbye from her because we lost her. Her signal is frozen. But the people behind her were actually in the United States. And as we've talked about so often, these are folks who quite literally are headed to border processing sites. They cross illegally. They have their plan. They just walk across the border and then turn themselves into Border Patrol. Border Patrol is so overwhelmed, they basically have stopped patrolling and turned themselves into processing sites. So. We'll check back in with Ali over the next couple of days. We want to bring in Pablo Manriquez of the Latino Rebels joining us now because a big part of the Remain in Mexico debate is raging inside the Democratic Party. And there's a lot of Democrats on Capitol Hill quite angry with President Biden uh, over this re-implementation. Uh, you know, the administration, Pablo, says, well, the court ordered us to do it, so our hands are tied. Why aren't progressives buying that? Well, I mean, I think that some progressives were buying. They were, I don't think the progressives were ever really buying it, but there were moderates that gave the administration the benefit of the doubt when it came to like the litigation that was holding up the rollback of this Trump era policy that's tremendously unpopular with in, in immigrant communities. Um, so I think that uh, one of the ways to think about um, the, the change is Bob Menendez, specifically the chair of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, came out against it last week, and ever since then, of course, like it's been a deluge of. Uh, uh, of of negative feedback from the Democratic caucus on Capitol Hill. So I don't see that changing anytime soon um, either. And I don't see, I, I, ultimately, I think that the problem that the Biden administration has right now is that like the Obama administration before it, it does not have strong leadership on the immigration portfolio, uh, immigration policy portfolio yeah. in the West Wing. Well, at the same time also, uh, Democrats and Republicans, I'm going all the way back to George W. Bush, couldn't figure out how to, solve the border crisis because even among fairly moderate democrats securing the southern border polls very well it's only the progressives that sort of care about this open border policy uh, i'm interested build back better right now the president's signature cradle the grave social spending plan is on life support uh, joe manchin put it there uh, today how much are progressives going to dig in their feet to get some form of immigration reform into that bill? I think entirely. I think that um, some form of immigration reform will be in the bill. The, the leader of that effort is Senate Majority Whip Dick Durbin from Illinois, who's had basically three decades of failure in trying to get some sort of relief since, you know, the, the next sort of phase of relief in the American Immigration Code after the Reagan amnesty. It's never happened. The only real relief that immigrants have gotten so far have been through executive orders in the White House. So right now in the Build Back Better Act, there's actually sort of a, a mixed bag or a hodgepodge of immigrant relief proposals. Yeah. And it has yet to be seen kind of which ones will survive, but I would expect that at least some of them will survive and as we've said before, Leland, like, you know, I think the Build Back Better Act will pass because ultimately Congress does like to spend money. And this <laughs> is a lot of money. Yeah, normally in Washington, they can all agree on spending money, which is why it's been sort yeah. of curious that that hasn't passed so far. I just want to get back to this, this divide in the Democratic Party over immigration. Mm. What, is, what does the Biden administration understand that progressives do not that's making them more hawkish on immigration than even the Obama administration? I actually think it's what they don't understand. Um, I think it's so the thing is, Biden has always been somebody who tries to play toward the sort of, you know, middle common denominator of the Democratic caucus. Immigration is not a topic where that works. So by playing toward the middle, he's playing like a more conservative hand. Sure. But the more conservative hand that he's playing is with policy hands from the Obama, the Obama administration, basically, like, you know, these people, there are very few, like, sort of crossovers that both worked at the high, highest levels of the West Wing on the Obama mm -hmm. immigration policy portfolio and the Trump immigration policy portfolio. Yeah, we're, we're so watching right that, now videos that you tweeted out um, of a protest there on Capitol Hill. Uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, among others, there uh, talking. Hey, Pablo, I hate to do this, but we got to run. It was great chatting. And uh, obviously, there's going to be a lot to talk about over the next couple of weeks. Yeah, I think there will be more immigration news this week, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, there, there, there might be. Stand by. Another tech giant took a trip to Capitol Hill. They head tomorrow. So is anything going to change this time around, or are we still just wasting time, money, and a number of likes on Instagram? We'll see you in a minute.
Why do you persist in behaving as a democratic super PAC, silencing views to the contrary of your political beliefs? We're not doing that. We realize we need to earn trust more. Will you continue to push back against this kind of foreign interference, even if powerful Republicans threaten to take official action? Senator, absolutely. The Mark Zuckerberg playbook at this point is no apologies, no admissions, no action. I believe we are well overdue to update the rules for the Internet. All right. Who can forget the highlights in the previous episodes of Congress versus Big Tech? It's been going on since 2018, and precisely nothing has changed. Big Tech does what it wants. Senators get to bloviate about how they're going to hold the billionaires to account. Tomorrow, the head of Instagram heads to the Hill. Probably won't be uh, any different with that, we bring in Vince Colonese, radio host in Washington, D.C., friend of the show, obviously, and also the editorial director of The Daily Caller. Hey, good to see you. Uh, yeah, you kind of just imagined he uh, had an Instagram is going to take it for a while and then go back and count his billions. Yeah, that's that's how these things go. And that's this is because both sides seem to agree that big tech is the bad guy. They're tapping into this populist sentiment among the electorate. Uh, who is very concerned about big tech, and then they make a lot of noise on Capitol Hill to suggest to voters they're doing something for them without actually doing anything meaningful. I mean, one of the things to look out for, Leland, is that Democrats and Republicans have radically different ideas about why big tech needs to be reformed in any capacity. Democrats would like more content to be censored on the platform. They say it's for safety reasons. They want to stop disinformation. Republicans, by and large, or at least their voters, want to see less content censored on the platform. They want a more open space to communicate without fear of censorship. And when those are the positions, they're never going to meet in the middle, and we're going to get a lot of fights like this. Yeah, it's kind of fun, though. You got both Marsha Blackburn and Richard Blumenthal, Democrat, Republican, agreeing that something has to be done. They're all upset about Instagram, and the algorithms got linked, leaked. Probably no surprise that Instagram's having their new teen safety proposal, uh, launching a take-a-break feature, no tags, new parental controls, you have to teach your parents how to use the parental controls. Uh, it, it, let me ask it this way. We only got 20 seconds. Is there yeah. something that could happen that would force Congress to take on big tech in a meaningful way? Well, I think that when the kids are exposed to threats, that's the thing. YouTube, when it was surfacing content that involved uh, basically child sex trafficking and concerns about that, boy, that's when Congress starts yeah. flying in. And here, Instagram, when it comes to teens and suicide, being linked to it, this, that's when government really starts getting you, sucked into You regulating. nailed it in 20 seconds. Dan Abrams next. Thanks, Vince. Thanks for watching. Click the red subscribe button below so you can get more of News Nation's fact-driven, unbiased coverage.